Right, should we get started? My name is Phil Underwood. I'm the Engagement Manager from the Society for the Environment. I've got the simple job of introducing the webinar. I will then hand over to our ex two expert speakers before going straight into a question and answer session to conclude. For those watching the webinar as a recording, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me on the details on your screen at the moment and I'll be, I'll be sure to get back to you. So the agenda for today. I'll very shortly be handing over to our first speaker, Caroline, to start off proceedings before handing over to Martin. I'll introduce the speakers in a little bit more detail when we get to their speaker sessions. I'm going to do a brief introduction to the Society for the Environment, it won't take very long, um, and then we'll get into the, uh, the webinar itself. So, the Society for the Environment holds a Royal Charter, which was awarded in 2004. We are the custodian of two professional registrations, the Chartered Environmentalist, or CM Register, and the Registered Environmental Technician, or RM Tech Register. The Society operates as an umbrella organization. Currently, there are 25 professional bodies as constituent bodies. And all of these bodies currently hold a license to award the CM of registration to their members. There are also three of these professional bodies who award the registered environmental technician registration, and these are currently highlighted. There's a total of just over 7,400 chartered environmentalists and registered environmental technicians overall. So that's a little bit about the Society for the Environment. Now to the webinar itself. This is the first of our expert-led series of webinars. These new series will provide perspectives from across our constituent bodies to increase knowledge transfer opportunities for our registrants and beyond. This three-part webinar series is based around the topic of waste reduction, with the final webinar in the series taking place exactly six months on from World Environment Day 2018, which is the, the 5th of December. So this series includes two expert speakers providing insight and case studies on each webinar. So six experts in total. And this is the second of the three part series. This webinar will mainly focus on the headline grabbing issue of plastics. So our first speaker today is Caroline Salthouse. She is a chartered environmentalist via IEMA, which is the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment and is Principal Consultant at Sea Salt House Environmental Consultancy Training and Events. She specializes in coastal issues and is on the management board of the North West Coast Forum. Caroline will be providing her insight into the world of plastics in the aquatic and marine environment. So, it's over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through in my talk, so I'm going to go through at quite a pace, and I hope um, that I will be clear. If I'm not clear, please let me know. <laughs> um, but um, I'm not going to waste any time saying anything more about myself. I shall just crack on with the presentation. So, uh, well, I will just say that as well as being on the management board of the Coastal Forum, I also um, provide management support in a voluntary capacity. So I'm going to run through... Um, uh, general scene setting and some of the drivers for change for the marine environment which people are just working in terrestrial um, places may not be aware of, why plastic matters, where it comes from and what some of the potential solutions might be. So there's an estimate and these are all estimates we can't possibly know that over 150 million tonnes of plastics are already in the ocean and up to 12 million tonnes are added every year. There are different forces. I saw a United Nations source yesterday that said 10 million tonnes, but it's a heck of a lot, whichever way you look at it. Ellen MacArthur Foundation did a study that, that uh, determined that about eight tonnes of um, plastic is dumped into the sea every minute. And if we don't change things by 2050, we could have more plastic by fish and more plastic than fish by weight in the sea, which is a pretty scary uh, scenario. And we don't really know what the consequences of all this are. We're starting to learn some of the consequences, uh, but they're much more far uh, reaching than many of us realised. And some of the problems, particularly with things like microplastics and microfibers, uh, we're only really just starting to recognise some of the issues. 
So it's a global issue. Um, we have uh, around the world um, five major ocean gyres, and we also have hotspots where plastics accumulate. Um, I've got the statistics for two of the, the major gyres, the North Atlantic and the North Pacific gyre, and you can see that the North Pacific gyre is an awful lot worse than the North Atlantic one, but that doesn't mean we should not worry about the North Atlantic either. Um, these figures are um, per square kilometre, so North Atlantic 20,000 roughly, uh, and North Pacific 330,000 pieces of plastic, and these pieces are usually small pieces of plastic, less than five millimetres, things that are broken down. It's not the big stuff that we're finding, it's the small stuff, it's known as plastic soup. And when you think about the size of these things, the North Pacific gyre is estimated to be 34 times the area of the Netherlands, France and Spain together. So that is a huge quantity. We also have issues with hotspots in other areas, and these tend to occur in kind of sea basins with narrow outlets like the Mediterranean. So if you look at the figures for the Mediterranean, which has many rivers and uh, many coastal cities and communities, the very small entrance to the, uh, the North Atlantic, Plastic tends to stay in the Mediterranean that goes into the Mediterranean from those land-based sources. And surveys have found that an average of 116,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometre, which is nearly six times more than the stuff that's out in the wider Atlantic Ocean. So that's, that's kind of scary as well. Um, moving on to something a little bit closer to home, this is the um, 2017 results from the Great British Beach Clean, which is usually done on the weekend in September by the Marine Conservation Society to have volunteer beach teams out all over the country doing beach cleans. So this is pieces of litter per 100 metres of shoreline, 911 England, 701 Northern Ireland, 677 Wales, and 491 Scotland. Um, that could be to do with the, the nature of the coast, um, the population living close to the coast, or just people's behaviour in those areas, who knows. When we look at the top 10, uh, plastic, uh, top 10 items of litter that are found, average number per 100 metres, we can see that by far the largest number of items found is small plastic and polystyrene pieces up to 50 millimetres. But many of the other things on this list, food packets, cigarette stubs, bottle caps, cord and string, wet wipes, cotton bud sticks, fishing line, cutlery trays and straws are made of plastic. It's not all plastic, but an awful lot of it is. Um, sources of it, about 46% don't really know where it's come from. 30% is pretty obviously dropped by the public or discarded. Um, about 11% of it is fishing items. About Eight and a half, nine percent of it's sewage related debris, items that have been flushed uh, that shouldn't have been. And then we go on down the list with shipping waste being slightly less, uh, there shouldn't be any shipping waste, it's legal stuff, but see, but it still goes on. And then fly tick stuff and medical items such as pill packets and syringes, which potentially have just been discarded by the public or could have been down through the sewage system as well. Um, and it, the, the, the Great British Beach Clean does get people very excited, people love to go out and do beach cleans, they get very involved and 339 beaches were done um, in 2017, 7,000 people were involved, 225,000 pieces of litter were removed but worryingly there was a 10% increase in the amount of litter found on 2016. So when we look at the drivers for change, uh, the first International Marine Debris Conference was held in 1984, so we've been aware of issues about marine debris, not necessarily just plastic, but other things as well, for a long time. And it's been recognised as a priority area by the United Nations Environment Programme's Global Programme of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment from land-based activities um, back in 2004 and more recently at Rio Plus 20. The OSPAR Commission, um, which is an um, uh, international organisation around the North East Atlantic, um, has a regional action plan for marine litter 2014 to 21, 2021, which aims to substantially reduce marine litter in the OSPAR maritime area to levels where properties and quantities do not cause harm to the marine environment. By 2020, we've only got two years, I don't think we're going to meet that target. It's a bit worrying. Uh, and this supports the North East Atlantic Environment Strategy, which is also an OSPAR Commission thing. And the UK, um, it's 15 governments in the European Union, um, and uh, it basically came from the 1972 Oslo Convention Against Dumping in the Marine Environment, which was broadened out to include land-based sources of marine pollution in um, 
trying to remember the date, 1974, and they were the two different conventions. That was uh, the Paris Convention. The, the two were brought together in 1992 to, to the Oslo Convention. So here in the UK, we also have the Marine Policy Statement, which says we need clean, healthy, safe, productive and biologically diverse oceans and seas. We have the government's 25 year environment plan, achieving zero avoidable plastic waste by the end of 2040. And they've been introducing a range of measures to tackle, tackle plastic litter. We have the microbeads ban, talking about single use plastic tap. They've currently got a consultation going on on uh, cotton bud sticks, straws and stirrers, plastic straws and stirrers. That closes on the 23rd of December. If anybody wants to have a look at that, it's on the government consultation website. Um, we have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is a European thing, but we have enshrined that in, in uh, UK law under the Marine Strategy Regulations 2010, which is a statutory instrument. And we have a commitment to achieve good environmental status of UK seas by 2020 under this. It kind of chimes with the UK's Marine Policy Statement. And marine litter is one of the descriptors. There are 11 descriptors that describe what good environmental status looks like, covering all sorts of things like contaminants um, by the food chain, hydrology, all sorts of different things. Um, but marine litter is one of them, and one of the indicators that's been used for marine litter is plastic in the stomach of formers, which is a type of seabird. There's quite a long data set because of um, some of the work that's been going on with that far. Um, why does it matter? Well, there are huge economic impacts. Um, tourism, it puts people off going to the beach if there's a lot of litter on the beach. And even when the water quality is good, it's been shown that people think if there's a lot of litter on the beach, the water quality is going to be poor, so they don't go back to that beach. Um, and I've said, particularly if there's sewage-related debris, FRD is sewage-related debris. The fishing industry, as well as contributing to the problem slightly, um, they also suffer a lot from it because marine litter can get tangled up in fishing gear and it can cause huge economic losses to them. Uh, we have a lot of um, flooding and water supply issues which directly affect householders and businesses um, uh, in sort of inland terrestrial areas. So we have plastic waste causing blockages in sewers, the sewers overflowing into people's homes. We have plastic waste causing blockages in communal sewers. I've had that problem in my back garden because the neighbour likes to push wet wax down the loop. Um, and it can cause things like fatbergs, and I think uh, you may have seen that there was an anatomy of a fatberg programme a while back. Um, Water UK published a report indicating that fatbergs are made up 93% of wet wipes, but only about 0.5% of fats, which is quite surprising that fat sticks it all together. And these things can be really, really huge, you know, size of trucks and things, and they can lead to um, quite major flooding in, in, in city centres and towns and things. And they have associated economic costs, increased insurance, insurance costs, hardship, um, loss of business, etc., etc. And then we have the cleanup costs. So beach cleaning costs across Europe have been estimated at 60 million euros a year. Um, the cost of unblocking the sewers in the UK is about 90 million pounds a year. And that's huge. And that's not all caused by plastic, but a lot of it is. Wildlife. Large items, entanglement and suffering. Uh, we've seen, uh, we've all seen pictures of animals caught up in um, fishing lines and things like that. We've seen pictures of turtles that have eaten uh, plastic bags and starved to death. There are also issues with small items going into the, the food chain. Microbeads and microbeads get ingested by plankton and filter feeders and then they go on up the food chain. And worryingly, um, Researchers have found pieces of plastic in all samples of mussels were tested in British waters and brought from overseas markets. And an indication that it is getting into the human food system, so it's getting into us, a uh, Leeds University report showing that um, water samples from the UK rivers downstream of wastewater treatment work have significantly higher concentrations of plastic. And there is all the research from across Europe that indicates that it is being uh, found in human sewage. And not just that we don't want to be eating plastic, but the plastics, the small plastics in particular, um, which get ingested, attract toxins like DDT, PCB, and they also attract um, the kind of bacteria that live on sewage. So, and these get into animal tissues, the animals that digest the, the plastic, they don't digest the plastic, but um, the things that are released during the digestion process and go into the tissues of animals and then we animals, so it's ultimately into us. 
sources of plastic, um, bad behaviour, flushing things that we shouldn't flush. Marine accidents, this was an interesting statistic. 2,683 containers lost at sea per year between 2011 and 2013. And I think that's an underestimate because there isn't a single database keeping track of it all and not all the losses are reported. Um, the containers break open, the contents spill out, and we'll, we'll, we'll see an example of that later. Poor product design and labelling. Wet wipes, a lot of wet wipes are made with plastic in them, and none in the UK meet the water industry standards for disposal in the sewer, but many are labelled as flushable, and they shouldn't be. Poor waste handling, um, industrial site landfills when things are not kind of properly secured, plastics can escape. Local authority bins not been emptied in a timely manner. That's becoming an increasing problem with austerity, council cuts, etc., etc. When we wash our clothes, we um, shed microfibers from the clothes. Plastic bottles and plastic pipes are now being found to shed microfibers as well. And then we have things like microbeads in all sorts of cosmetic products. The toothpaste, well, not toothpaste in the UK, toothpaste in America, but um, cosmetic products in the UK. And while we have now got a microbead plan in place, it doesn't cover every size of microbead, it doesn't cover every type of product, probably didn't go far enough. So we need to think about the persistence and the cumulative effect. It's not a quick fix problem. The average plastic bottle takes about 450 years to break down. It does depend what kind of plastic it's made out of. But a lot of the time, these things are not actually breaking down. They're, they're, well, they are breaking down. They're breaking down into tiny pieces. They're not actually um, sort of composting or anything like that. Um, there's a separation of the cause and the impact. So plastics of all sizes travel in the aquatic and marine environment vast distances, ocean to ocean. And I mentioned before about containers losing, being lost overboard. There was um, a very famous incident of a container off a ship that was going from America to China in 1992. Uh, which lost um, a container including plastic bath toys, which had plastic ducts. And these ducts have circulated the globe. They've actually been used to track ocean currents. Uh, and they ended up in the UK, on beaches in the UK in the mid-2000s, and have now been um, found all over Europe, as well as all over the rest of the world. Plastic's a valuable resource. It's made from oil. Why are we just chucking it away? And even if it were possible to clean it all up, what is the ultimate cost of that going to be? And if it's even possible, and if it's not possible, what's the ultimate cost of not being able to clean it up? So, um, the pollute pays principle is, is broken. It's not really the industries that generate the plastic waste that pay. It's all of us, everybody. We're all paying for it. So, what are the solutions to get from this kind of situation, which is a beach in Merseyside, I'm afraid, to the picture below, which is also a beach in Merseyside? <laughs> Responsible manufacturing, responsible waste handling and disposal, and responsible decision shifts. If only it was all so easy. But, you know, hopefully we can, we can make some moves in this direction. So I think in terms of responsible manufacturing, we really need to get into the sort of product design stage, and we need to be thinking a lot more about not just um, a particular industry's waste streams and how they deal with those, but actually what's going to happen when the consumer, when it gets out there, when it's being used, at the product design stage, we need to think about that. Zero waste is the perfect solution because nothing is being wasted, nothing is escaping, nothing is being lost. Um, but you know, even if we can't do zero waste, we can think a lot more carefully about how products are going to be used. There is a problem with this because people as designers are not environmental experts, and the environmental experts don't always foresee every problem. But there are clear and shocking examples of where this thing has really not occurred. And the microbeads in a wash down the drain product is an obvious one. That's just deliberate plastic littering as far as I'm concerned. And flushable wipes when they're not actually flushable. One manufacturer, uh, when queried about uh, why the product was labelled as flushable, said, well, it, they flush a wipe, it doesn't block that toilet. It doesn't block that toilet, but it will go on and join with others and block who knows what further down the the stream and it doesn't degrade, so it shouldn't have been such anyway. There's also the problem that manufacturers are not here to save the planet, they're here to make money for their investors and their shareholders, so they're really only interested in the profitable options. But responsible product design can be that, and there are lots of things that can help with that. Peer competitive pressure, consumer pressure, uh, taxes, other charges, and legislation. So, what can we do? We can think about designing out the problem. There's uh, been a, a research project uh, funded by Life Plus in Europe, which 
which looked at microplastic fibre production from textiles during washing. And they've identified um, five different things that are really important in, in terms of how much shedding takes place for the fibre length, the yarn twist, the linear density of the textile, fabric density, and textile auxiliaries that these are things that protect the fibres from abrasion during laundering. And so you can take this research, look at it, and, and, and design a yarn which is less likely to shed. Um, that would be a really good thing to do. Consumer pressure switched the stick. So City C, which is an English uh, community interest company, and the Scottish charity Feedra had a campaign which was very, very much supported by the public uh, and persuaded nine major retailers to agree to phase out plastics on cotton book switched paper in their own brand products by the end of 2017. And these retailers joined Johnson & Johnson and Waitrose who already phased out plastic um, no cotton books from spring 2017 and the co-op and options who are already using paper sticks. Um, and I think, um, I can't remember quite, um, I think not the expenses, uh, it was down to the Marine Conservation Society and the Action Group, um, the, the, it's an NGO group, and, we've all, and I think some, some uh, industry and lots of companies have been involved with it as well, um, and we've been trying to persuade people to uh, do good things. This is one of the early, early successes. So uh, obviously we need to ensure that when we're moving plastic waste and handling plastic waste, we're making sure it's not escaping. We're saying that nurdles have been found a lot on beaches and these are things which are being sent to recycle, or they're part of the plastic recycling process. Um, they're obviously um, ending up in the marine environment because they're being shipped in shipping containers or whatever, or they're being stored on riverside somewhere and they're escaping into those rivers. Um, so the closer we can put the waste processing and recycling to the waste source, the better. Uh, obviously, adhering to the relevant legislation, best practice guidelines and things. I've already mentioned about the issue with local authorities emptying bins regularly. People litter where there is a lot of waste and if they can't put it in a bin, they'll just dump it on the floor and exit the bin quite often. Uh, for the consumer, we need to have bins and recycling points in places where they can actually access and use them. And we need to ensure adequate waste reception points in ports and harbors. So uh, RAP has um, a plastics pact, which is uh, bringing together various organisations with governments and NGOs to tackle plastic waste and try and create a circular economy for plastic and transform the UK plastic packaging sector. Um, and it's got some really ambitious targets for 2025, um, and it includes um, a lot of major businesses uh, a lot of the major supermarkets and um, the, the British Plastics Federation, quite a lot of the, the drinks uh, producers and things like that. Um, fishing for Litter is a, an Osbar uh, promoted initiative where fishermen, um, when they're out fishing, they tend to collect marine litter in their nets as well as fish. So they've been provided with bags, they can put the marine litter in the bags, they can take them back to registered ports. And they can dispose of that litter for free. They don't have to pay waste, um, char waste handling charges on that stuff as they've, they've got it in these special bags. And it, it works two ways because not only does it help reduce the amount of large marine litter that's floating around in the oceans, but it also raises fishermen's awareness of the issues in marine litter because they're less likely to be selling themselves. And there are currently 435 vessels and 50 ports involved in these streams in the northeast Atlantic, which includes the UK. Um, in terms of responsible citizenship, it's all the usual, reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, pea paper and poo down the loo. Um, two of the ones that I wanted to focus on on this slide really were um, the microfibers in washing machines. There are fibre filters, there are bags that you can put things in which supposedly keep the fibres out. There are also balls which supposedly collect the fibres. I don't know how effective they all are, but they do exist. And I know there is work going on, on more on those as well. But one of the things we can all do is use fabric conditioners and reduce washing temperatures because they've been shown to reduce uh, fiber loss from textiles as well. Reusable sanitary products, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but I will say that if anybody's interested in this, um, it's not as interesting as it sounds, have a look at the City to Sea website. There is a fabulous video of four women talking about their experiences of using these things and their recommendations. And obviously getting involved in community action. So next. Bit is um, what we can all do to encourage responsible citizenship. 
by queer accurate product labeling. Don't put flushable on things, but don't flush. Um, public education, the Attenborough effect, fabulous. It's, people are really thinking about plastics in the environment now. Uh, I've already talked about waste disposal and recycling, making it easier, making it more consistent across the country. Deposit return schemes, they work in other countries, they need to be reintegrated here. We used to do it across bottles, why do we not do it? Um, supporting citizen action, such as beach clean groups. Industry can get involved with that, local authorities can get involved with that, and, they, and some, some do. Um, and then there can be encouragement like awards. So, uh, North Coastal Forum has the North Coastal Awards Coastal Excellence, and we quite often give the community action awards to each clean groups. And uh, just some graphics on people use. And so, this is Northern Bay Partnership Beach Care Group, uh, which has removed over 40 tons of litters from the beaches around Northern Bay since 2003. So, fantastic. They won one of our awards. Concluding thoughts. It's not the first persistent pollutant that's unexpectedly caused problems in the wider environment. Is the next plastic already out there? Is the next thing that we, we need to be thinking about already out there? Or is it just needs to be on the horizon? And so what is it? What can we learn from our experience with plastic and our previous experience with other substances like CDT springs to mind? And what do we need to do to change our thinking on manufacturing and waste processes and behaviour so it doesn't happen again? Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Caroline. We're going to hand over to Martin Ballard now. Martin is a, a Chartered Environmentalist via IEMA as well, and is the Group Environment Manager at Wilmot Holdings. Uh, he's also a Chartered Manager. Uh, Martin will be discussing plastics, but asks the question, plastic, waste or material? Um, again, we've got, we're hoping to have some questions at the end. We do have some questions that are already in, so thank you very much for sending them through, but please keep sending those questions in and we'll get that those questions to our speakers today. Uh, and that will be the, at the end of Martin's talk. So, Martin, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much for that, Phil, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to join you. Um, I, uh, it'd be remiss of me just to give uh, a little bit of context to those who have, uh, of you who might not be familiar with Wilmot Dixon. Um, we're a privately owned business with uh, Rick Wilmot as our group chief, chief exec, uh, who's obviously a great descendant uh, of the uh, the founder in 1852. Um, we, we cover nationally, as you can see there from, from the graphic, with a few more offices now uh, covering down Exeter, um, as well as Gateshead in the, uh, the top right. Uh, the, the nature of the business is very much community uh, focused um, with uh, over a million pounds through the uh, foundation program invested for betterment of uh, the communities in, in which we work. Uh, and, and obviously the, the accolades uh, then, then follow then with uh, um, the major contractor recognition and the Queen's Award for Enterprise in 2014 and, and most recently uh, earlier this year with promoting opportunity, both of which we're, we're particularly proud of. Um, but we we hold ourselves um, uh, to account through uh, a number of different different organisations, including CCS, the Considerate Constructors Scheme, uh, of which we've been founding um, partners with since 1995. Uh, and uh, we're delighted with the recognition last year that given the, the highest volume of projects that we've got, uh, that we uh, average the, the greatest, which is no mean feat. And, and part of that is in recognition of the, uh, the, the, the standards that we hold ourselves within the communities we work in terms of the housekeeping uh, and uh, the, the way that uh, we present ourselves and our industry. Uh, so in terms of the way we're structured, uh, we've got the um, uh, three elements to, to the group. Uh, Woman Dixon Holdings, which is the... Uh, the core of the business with a construction interiors uh, activities um, uh, eco world which is a developer um, uh, business and we'll see see some examples of that in a moment and Fortem uh, on the left which is a housing association um, uh, and uh, facilities management maintenance business and in terms of the scope of, of what we do um, obviously cover construction of of new assets and refurbishment of, of existing public and commercial properties, uh, fit out of, of existing 
uh, office and retail space, um, residential developments and creating that sense of, of space and place. Um, the residential developments with, uh, with their eco world, uh, homes for private rent with the, the Be Here brand, and residential repairs and maintenance. Now, given, given that scope um, of uh, coverage across the built environment, and you can see within each of those images, there's a huge amount of plastic involved. And you know, just focusing on, on this last one, the UPVC windows, uh, the tools that we use, um, and uh, the everyday products that we enjoy on a day-to-day -day life within the, uh, the built environment, we could not do as efficiently and effectively without a, a highly valuable material based around plastics. Um, and, and in particular, sorry, just jump, jumped on that one, around energy efficiency. Some of the improvements that we've made to the built environment uh, in the last 20, 30 years have been because of insulation materials which are plastic based. Um, so, you know, there's there's both a, a huge opportunity that we've gained from this, this material, um, but it does present some significant risks which uh, we'll come on to in a moment. So just a bit more on the company in terms of depth of scales. So we, we manage over 100 projects, sort of operating around 140 projects a year with about one billion pound turnover. Uh, one of the main developer-led um, projects that we've got going at the moment is the redevelopment of Brentford Football Club Stadium with a thousand homes and uh, retail uh, around that, um, so the relocation of the club. Um, but we've also transformed a number of set town centres. Woolwich uh, was completed uh, five years ago and Rochdale is in full swing now. Uh, and in terms of the volume of, uh, of repair and maintenance activities, 170,000 uh, properties which have been maintained. So you know, new, new air conditioning um, uh, systems and kitchens and, and bathroom replacements. So again, you know, a significant amount of plastics that, that, uh, uh, that, that we work with as well. And obviously, there's a lot of training around uh, how to, uh, to repair and maintain that, that, that all the materials that, that we use. Um, and yeah, here's some you know, further examples of some of the expertise from an environmental um, perspective. So we've we've got a, a significant commitment, something we we hold ourselves in great store with is being a responsible business. It's a uh, cornerstone um, to our sustainability commitment, um, with you know, a significant progress on construction waste being diverted from landfill, which takes a significant um, degree of, of, of effort and work with the right partners that can help recover the waste streams that, that we generate and it's that that uh, I really want to, to focus on for a moment because you, you've, you've all seen a waste hierarchy I'm sure of one form or another um, and you, you will know that uh, the further we can work up that hierarchy the more opportunity that we've got to eliminate the risk, uh, reduce its impact and you know, reuse the materials where where we're able uh, and recycle and recover. And it's it's really very impressive as to how for for all waste streams, not not just um, plastic, uh, how the um, uh, the waste sector has improved uh, in in the last two decades. But um, as as we'll find, there's significant um, uh, opportunities there. Uh, none la least in the last 12 months with the issues that have been forced on the UK recycling uh, economy to uh, to deal with that challenge. And I guess our story um, with uh, uh, with plastic waste uh, is not a new one. I mean, m most recently there's littering from vehicles in April this year with the regulations extended from London to, to the entire UK. Um, littering is not a new thing. We you've no doubt heard of Keep Britain Tidy. Um, did you know that that was first founded in 1954? Um, it, it was actually the National Federation of the Women's Institute that passed a resolution in that year to keep Britain tidy. Uh, the charity was then established in 1960 uh, and the Tidy Man logo that you, you might recall um, uh, was first founded in 1969 and in this year, that logo was uh, was re relaunched. So the legislation's been there, but as you can see from some of these images, and if you've ever got uh, caught um, in your travels, uh, sat at a road junction 
um, uh, or a busy roundabout and just take a, a moment to safely glance out of the windows to, to, to your left. You, you will have undoubtedly seen these horrific images and it's, it's, it's probably uh, the, the right word. It is a heinous situation that, that, uh, that we find uh, across the built environment. Uh, yet it's not new. This has been a, a challenge that we've been pushing on since 1954 as a community. So it was, it was really encouraging that um, uh, in this year with World Environment Day, um, uh, as an, an IEMA Employers uh, Forum member, uh, we committed to collaborate for action um, and uh, we uh, worked uh, together around the theme that the United Nations set which was you know, very c convenient off the, the Attenborough uh, effect, as uh, Caroline rightly mentioned. Um, we we, we recognised as a cohort um, that there was, uh, there was opportunity for us to uh, try and recognise the scale of the problem and the challenge and break some inertia by working together. Um, there's a, a very good quote from Will Greenwood at the uh, Wilmot Dixon-sponsored Manchester's developing leaders event last week that if you want to go fast you go alone but if you want to go far you go together and you know that that's very very much the case of any any rugby team as Will Green would would, would know but any collaborative team um, uh, as hopefully you'd agree we, we all are as, as professionals uh, we've got to be able to recognize the challenge and uh, uh, and work together. So we, we collaborated with Society for the Environment and its broader members, uh, with IEMA, um, uh, who provided the um, a significant resource to, to pull us all together and resources, um, linking up with uh, Less Plastic, which is a charity uh, that I'm sure that you've seen a number of um, uh, logos and information for. Um, we'll see the plastic facts um, that Caroline's mentioned are uh, uh, broadly represented here as well, so I won't won't dwell on on those. The scale of the challenges is immense, um, and th and this is the sort of you know, very personal um, uh, infographics that Less Plastic has has provided, uh, and that we were able to uh, to use through the the World Environment Day campaign uh, events earlier this year. So there's lots of great tips. We know what the right thing to do, and you know, for us perhaps. Uh, as the uh, the converted, um, it's um, uh, it's more of a challenge as to how we get beyond um, uh, our own cohort and uh, uh, engage with with others. And, and through World Environment Day this year, we were um, particularly touched by the volume of non-professional engagement uh, from the campaigning that. Uh, that was done uh, with IEMA and Society for the Environment. And, you know, six months on, I, I can't, uh, uh, we, we, we're not quite there. We, we're a couple of weeks away from that six month uh, date of uh, uh, 5th of December uh, on from the 5th of June. Um, and the, the work that's going on behind the scenes to pull together the stats as to the, the scale of uptake of the resource that was put together through World Environment Day and uh, the stats on the number of pledges um, that have been uh, delivered on and also other pledges that have snowballed out of it because one thing's very apparent that um, World Environment Day is just one day in a year. Um, it's about the journey that we go on from there and what we do together and how we um, springboard off, off one another uh, um, when, when we see the case studies, see what's been done and see what's possible by getting in contact with one another and, and doing more of the same, but on a, on a grander scale or picking up very technical um, perspective. Um, so I'll, I'll just want to return back to plastic as a, as a valuable material because it was one of the things that we reflected on as a business at the start of the year was, well, okay, what sort of plastics do we personally use as individuals and uh, throughout our, our projects uh, and on our sites? So you know, there's a huge amount of communication that goes on when we set up each of our projects, uh, when we uh, set a footprint within a community that may or may not want us there as a, as a business. They might object to the, uh, the approved planning, but need needless uh, to say, we, we obviously actively engage, uh, understand the challenges uh, and 
perspectives they had and, and set the standard that we'd expect of a, of a company working in that community. And there's a lot of signage involved, a lot of engagement, a lot of materials as part of that, that setup um, to, to create the right professional standard that, that we'd all expect. In addition, people have to rightly work safely and we have a, an all safe commitment um, for uh, everybody that comes to site and works in and around our sites, uh, make sure that we, we uh, undertake the activities for all trades, um, uh, mindful for, uh, for the community safety as well. There's a significant amount of you know, hard hats and face to fit uh, masks, uh, which you can see the, the bin full of um, canisters uh, uh, filter canisters uh, in the right hand corner there and when you look at the stats of what we've purchased uh, and used in in the last two years um, full effect years uh, they're, they're no no small volume uh, obviously the the volume of filter canisters is uh, has petered um, uh, uh, dependent on the volume of, of use as with the number of hard hats with a uh, with, with a, you know, a, a turnover um, of those uh, those materials uh, when they come to their end of their safe life, um, then the question is, what do you do do with it? So, looking back at our stats uh, of plastic waste that we've generated since 2011, uh, which is when we made a significant change to our uh, reporting mechanisms we've got a better data set over that period you can see that you know on average uh, with all of the plastics that we create through the uh, the construction process um, with you know plastics that we might find find in, in the ground through uh, through brownfield development uh, as well as within uh, the demolition of existing buildings and you know the plastics that, that come to site and whether that's PPE um, or signage or protective material, um, uh, sorry, protective packaging to, to protect the materials that are delivered to site. Um, but those are you know, certainly the, the largest challenge that we've got is, is the packaging and, and works protection measures to make sure that we can hand over a quality product to our customer uh, with, without any, uh, uh, any glitches at the end of, of, of the job. Of course, there's a double irony in there that um, we're bringing materials to site. They have to be protected in their carriage from whichever country or um, uh, factory of, of origin within the UK. Um, we have to protect them whilst you know, a number of other trades are operating within the uh, within that work environment, um, and uh, then you know, make sure that uh, at the at the end of the job, the, um, uh, the the new school or the leisure centre is handed over. In, in good order um, and generally speaking plastic protection uh, measures are, are used of, of one form or another uh, and like I say that's a significant volume um, so whilst there has been some improved diversion over the period um, and you know as you can see at the, the bottom there we're we get into a 97 percent um, uh, 96 97 percent on, on average in, in the last couple of years there has been an improvement um, the, the the question really is uh, how, how well is that material being recovered uh, within the UK for UK betterment and, and so the decision that China has, has taken in 2018 to uh, to turn off the tap for reception of, of uh, plastic and and other waste um, has uh, has forced the issue um, uh, for the waste sector to uh, to tackle, how mature though is the UK's waste sector, uh, and how ready is it to actually deal with, with that that material? And that's something that we've <clears throat> we've been um, uh, lo looking at specifically from a, uh, a PPE perspective as a team looking at uh, works protection measures uh, as well. So just reflecting on, on some of the, the simple things, if you like, our progress in the last six months um, since World Environment Day, uh, we've had a fantastic commitment from our office managers and our exec PAs, removal of single-use plastics. You know, it's a very simple, very effective measure, um, but within the catering and, and kitchen facilities, uh, any catering that's ordered in, so reusable trays, uh, reusable covers, um, uh, you know, if, if forks and the like are needed, then you know, let's make sure they're, they're wooden uh, or use um, uh, you know, forks and what have you within, within the kitchens. Um, there's a, a plastics-free initiative that's, that's been set up um, 
uh, and that's looking at uh, uh, some of the, the, sh the, the, the medium to longer term opportunities, which we'll come on to in, in a moment. Um, we've always had a preference to install uh, mains water supply dispensers rather than the, uh, uh, the plastic bottle ones um, for, for all heat, heat road, road of reasons. Um, um, not least the manual handling uh, challenge of, of dealing with those, but you know, fundamentally, plastic bottles uh, are not a, uh, a sustainable means for a carriage of, a, uh, of, of drinking water. Um, in some circumstances, they might be absolutely necessary where, where we don't uh, have the, uh, the setup uh, options, but uh, uh, certainly the preferences for, for mains installed. Uh, I've mentioned PPE recovery for recycling. We have a, a threefold approach to, to PPE recovery. When, when you think of any PPE in workwear, it's predominantly plastic in one form or another, whether it's a hard hat, goggles, um, uh, face fit, uh, um, respiratory masks, uh, your fleece, gloves, uh, high vis jacket, uh, and, uh, and workwear trousers. There's a predominant uh, uh, volume of, uh, of plastic in, in all of those. And uh, there's, there's two challenges. One is how to uh, segregate those and get those to a, a place of, uh, of, of recovery. Uh, and the other is how to protect the workwear brand and ensure that uh, it's not abused. And um, uh, so we, we are working with, uh, with our uh, logistics providers to recover those um, back to our PPE supplier, uh, JSP down in, in Whitney, um, to, uh, to reuse the HDPE materials from, from hats and, and goggles and the like. Um, uh, and that, you know, in terms of quality, um, is, is best used within plastic barriers, traffic barriers and the like because of the, uh, uh, the, the colour quality um, uh, around that. And workwear that it goes for um, brand protection and uh, and destruction to designated uh, EFW plants uh, in in the country. Um, the amount of community uh, activity that that our project teams undertake with litter picks around the sites, whether it's you know stuff that's that's uh, uh, originated from uh, trades coming to our site, but predominantly it's uh, littering that's blown onto uh, the fringes of our site that uh, we uh, uh, will pick. Um, so there's urban uh, litter picks as well as beach cleans uh, on and after World Environment Day this year in particular. Um, but there's not been a new thing for us. It. It's just been very much a, a refocus on, on those existing activities. I guess, you know, how good are we at collecting the stats uh, of how much we've collected? Um, and I'll, I'll come on to an example of that in a moment. Uh, I've mentioned the Works Protection uh, Plastics Working Group um, and some of the better waste segregation and liaison with waste service providers to uh, on, on around the options of recovery uh, of those wastes. It's, it's a particularly complicated area because of the array of different types of plastic and the um, uh, what, what is recoverable at the moment in the UK and what can't be recovered you know, the, the, the yogurt pot uh, uh, scenario, um, those lighter weight plastics, which you know, are either um, uh, at risk of being highly contaminated or, or cross-contaminated with other um, uh, cementaceous or, uh, um, uh, or, or paint um, materials uh, and you know, can only effectively uh, go for uh, EFW. Um, some of the things that uh, different parts of the business have been doing, uh, our 410 colleagues uh, had a fantastic plastic, fantastic campaign, um, which really engaged uh, their, uh, their teams uh, really effectively. And some of the stats that they're pulling together on the number of cleanup, the, the volumes of, of material um, that, that they, they gathered bags of um, has, has been really good. And we, we, I think, can all learn from... Uh, uh, from what Fortan have been doing with with their teams and the communities in which they serve, um, uh, you know, some of the stats when when they when they publish those will, will be really exciting. Um, some of the other areas, uh, our Wales and the West team had a, uh, a come dine with me challenge, which uh, was you know really engaging with uh, teams across their their area uh, and very palatable as well. But you know, some of the feedback as to you know, how easy or frankly not it was for them to um, put together a meal for, for four of them two course meal 
with you know, minimal plastic and the lengths that uh, uh, some of the teams had to, to go to to do that was extraordinary. Um, so we've still got a long way to go. It really, uh, uh, really you know, highlighted the, the challenge that we've got um, to, uh, to make that difference as individual shoppers. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, keeping uh, the place uh, tidy, it's great to see uh, organisations such as Transition Town Letchworth, uh, who have made a, um, a, a, a plastic-free town pledge and commitment. The fact that our head office is there as well is a great thing for us to, to find. And I'm, I'm aware that there are other uh, town groups um, uh, like this who are uh, looking to engage with, with companies and organisations. So do look out for them and, uh, and, and let's all play play part in uh, in support with with our head office in lecture that uh, a, a large number of um, the the, uh, the teams there live within uh, the vicinity and therefore play a strong part in in the place where they work and live um, and, and in, in particular Sarah Hall is our our group she instructed to lead on that it was a great thing for, for her to do Looking beyond then, um, so sort of the mid to long term, um, some of the things we looked at are venues and events that, that you know are single use plastic free. There's still a challenge. You know, marketing will, and, and marketing items that I see predominantly are plastic based. There, there are some you know good uh, you know, sort of bamboo type equivalents of, of various products and what have you. Um, and it's those that you know if we're not asking for them. Um, then we're not going to get the, the right outcome. So when we're setting up corporate events, try to begin with the end in mind. And that's 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 quite a you know, challenge, getting, getting some consistency from the marketplace around those events and, uh, and venues and, and what's used and what's available. So mentioned around PPE and workflows, of course, what's delivered offshore onto shore. Uh, we have delivered to our site teams in kit bags. Um, uh, but what happens with the plastic, those material, that those items are, are delivered to our supplier. So we're not got to the, the true root, root cause. We're designing um, uh, more effectively now um, uh, than ever. And we've got a standard yellow book for design, but there's still a lot of test and challenge that we've got to do around what our, what our specifications are, are for. Um, and I've mentioned the others. So I think some of the longer term challenges, I think just seeing the foreign objects that uh, could arise from our site, recognizing uh, windblown risk and seeing it beyond littering, um, gain an effective segregation recovery of those plastic materials. And you know, if, if you are aware of um, uh, waste uh, streaming and, and recovery by different type, then we'd be very interested to, to hear from you so as that we can all help um, improve the maturity and capacity of, of our waste industry onshore rather than our reliance offshore. Um, and then that would then help us better celebrate real circular economy successes uh, and, and put, push on from there. So just very quickly, a few images of what we might see. So we spoke about insulation materials and when it comes to um, decommissioning, this is a huge challenge as to how you can take down a building without fragments of polystyrene and uh, and, and insulation materials fragmenting, um, uh, either you know in construction or deconstruction, and you know you just have to look on on the beaches and, and see um, you know these these sort of materials um, uh, arising. Um, but also the, the, the trend uh, towards use of polystyrene for ground formworks has been highly effective. You know, it does work well, it does move with the environment well um, in terms of expansion um, and thermal um, uh, avoidance of thermal bridging uh, with, with concrete structures. But it's particularly fragile and you know, within, um, uh, within the groundworks is is liable to break up and then we'd be wind blown within the area and of course you know if it's used in uh, perhaps not the right way then it will equally break up as well um so you know what 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 we're designing and uh and using in, in construction and has a particular bearing on on our challenge for deconstruction and, and avoidance of, of that plastic uh, 
risk. So in, in summary, we've made a great start um, since, uh, uh, since uh, World Environment Day. Collaboration is the key to success and how we can work to help our waste sector understand our needs and move on and then have a, a real spotlight uh, on, on those successes. Uh, collaboration is the, the key. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, can you help play, play the part? Let, let's talk. Look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. That was really quite interesting. And thank you very much, Caroline, beforehand. Um, some uh, eye-watering stats to begin with, um, and then some, some interesting options for, for solutions. Um, I'm, I'm not an environmental professional myself. Um, however, the, the plastics per kilometre in the ocean is something that um, strikes fear into me slightly as a surfer. Um, I quite literally come into contact with it, so um, something that uh, I might think about a little bit more. But yes, thank you very much for both of those talks there. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Please keep those coming in now. That would be fantastic. Um, we did have some questions via the registration process for the webinar. Um, so we're going to go through those to begin with, uh, and then we'll just wait for some of the questions to come in. We do have uh, quite a few of them there, so we'll run through those. So the first question, uh, how can how can the construction industry reduce its plastics and packaging consumption? Now you may have already covered a little bit of this, uh, Martin, but uh, any, any more on that one? Uh, it, I think by, by working with, with the designers, architects, and uh, with our suppliers, uh, I know there's there's a lot of work going on on, on around that. Um, uh, and I think that's yeah. I think the opportunities to understand the risk of these materials as the the impact of microfibers and uh, microplastics becomes more apparent. Uh, understand the uh, the source and the pathway, and um, uh, you know see see what alternatives are available and to, to lock it in more effectively. Okay, fantastic. Um, and we have another question in here as well uh, what is the most effective way to achieve cultural or behavioral change around waste and recycling at work um, if I if I put that towards you Martin to begin with and then uh, we'll uh, skip over to Carol uh, it's, it's very much about understanding the why and the consequences of, of not segregating materials I think you know Going back to the Keep Britain Tidy campaign that we can all remember as kids and and uh, and the like, uh, you know, it's not a new topic. It, it's just something that you know we just need to keep plugging and pushing at, uh, ensuring that people understand why, what the consequences are, and uh, how they can uh, do things in a simple, easy, effective way. But I think if there's more confidence that um, those materials are going to be um, recovered and and reused, then I think there might be some more hope from uh, individuals and, and organisations to do more. I think I think that's the, the real cause cause of the challenge at the moment is um, is making sure that we've got a decent recovery route for, for all, all of these uh, these waste plastics that we clearly don't have at the moment. Okay, fantastic. Any input from you on that one, Caroline? Yeah, I mean, I, I call, my, my, my work experience is mainly office-based, um, but um, having sort of environmental champions within work teams can really help because um, if, if people sort of trained up and understand the issues and then they can go in and convince their colleagues that there are issues, you know, what, what they need to do, and to have recycling points within the workspace which are easy for people to access, it's easy for people to understand what they need to do with them, it's just getting that education out through the workforce about how important it is and i think the fishing for litter initiative in in, in, in some ways is, is, is a way of doing that with, with the fishermen because it's helping the fishermen that work the boats that are not environmental professionals they don't understand that they're fishermen um, it helps them actually understand that there is an issue and they're not stop thinking about why there's an issue and they you know it all helps it's that education but it's actually getting them engaged with doing something positive about it yeah yeah um i'm very conscious of time but we're just going to crack on with some questions i hope that's okay with you too um and we shall try and answer some of these questions from um that have been asked live during the webinar um so this one is aimed at uh, martin again um 
does Wilmot Dixon work to a best practice approach for managing plastic materials and waste in the construction industry and what practical guidance I assume that means what practical, what practical guidance is there available? Yeah, I hope Anna's still still with us, but if not, we need to. I see she's had to uh, to scoot. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, for me, it's just basics of material controls and housekeeping. It, it's as simple as that. Um, does it have to be you know uh, yeah any, any more complex than that? I really don't think so. It's just the behaviours of keeping more delicate materials at the back of the house away from logistics corridors um, where they're, you know, as they're more fragile, they're likely to, uh, uh, to incur greater damage um, and uh, in, ensure that the, the housekeeping in the workplace is good, not just from an all safe uh, workspace, but also uh, being all safe for the environment uh, in that place of, uh, of source uh, of, of potential um, uh, pl uh, plastic pollution source. Um, and then the, the next question I see is around who's responsible for implementation of littering from vehicle regs. Yes. It, predominantly, it's the police um, uh, in terms of you know, littering, and uh, you know, it depends on the scale of it. But could could get into the verge of fly tipping um, uh, as well. So EHOs, um, uh, but yeah, it's mainly PCSOs, police, and, and, and EHOs. Austerity, though, has sadly had a, a significant resource impact on. Uh, on clear up and clean up and uh, perhaps there's you know uh, more of a greater opportunity and more of an imperative as to why um, community uh, offences uh, uh, should focus on on this area of environmental clear up. That's an interesting one. I, uh, that's, uh, that's something I've learned today so that's good. Um, another question here is again for Martin. What happens currently to old UPVC windows are they sent for EFW I'm unaware of that acronym but I'm sure you can fill me yeah, in yeah and energy for, for waste that would be um, okay. I I really don't know um, uh, I I know that um, uh, that um, th there is you know recovery of UVPC I don't know the stats around it. I think I, I should say I'm not aware that it goes for, for EFW. Um, I, I think um, <laughs> I'm saying on a personal level now because my, my windows were replaced with the old uh, uh, UVPC and stainless <laughs> that went away. I, I think that was all, all recovered um, back to the factory uh, with uh, with my local manufacturer in Peterborough. Um, uh, but yeah, on, on a national scale, really don't know what the, the recycling rates are, I'm afraid. Okay, no problem at all. Another question that's come in here is, are the regulatory hurdles too great, such as demonstrating end of waste, which is affecting potential new processes for recycling of end of life plastics? Who might be able to comment on that one? Does that mean zero waste? Is he asking about zero, the zero waste sort of potentially? Potentially. Um, <laughs> demonstrating yeah. end of waste, which is affecting potential new processes for recycling of end of life plastics. Do, would we need a bit more clarification on that one? Possibly. I mean, if he's talking about zero waste, I can see what he means, that it could potentially um, impact on the recycling plastic business or recycling waste businesses because they wouldn't have waste to recycle. But um, I don't know. Okay, no problem at all. Um, we have had a question about the Pledge Less Plastic campaign as well. Uh, they're keen to understand whether the Society of the Environment has been able to measure the effect or, or impact of the Pledge Less Plastic campaign. And that's something probably myself and Martin might be able to contribute a little bit to. Um, we are in the process of following up with a number of the pledges that were made by organisations um, to see how their pledges have turned out, uh, whether they have been able to stick with them, uh, whether they have um, succeeded and, and gone further with their, their pledges. Uh, so that's something we're currently doing and hopefully we'll get some measurability from that. Um, anything from Wilmot Dixon on that one? Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think it's a great question. Uh, it was something that we set out uh, at the beginning um, as to how we could measure the outcome 
Um, unfortunately, GDPR came along at the same time, which rather uh, hampered the ability to, to sort of earmark individuals for their pledges. Um, so the, the activity of, uh, of, of trying to measure the outcome is down to um, a follow-up of, of individual pledges um, and, to, uh, and to, to, to get that, that feedback on that basis. Um, so it's, it's quite a laborious process, which was was taking a bit of time. We've not got the, the stats to share today, I'm afraid, but do, do keep an eye out because I'm, I'm sure that there'll be plenty of comms uh, off the back of Pledge Less Plastic um, uh, hashtag to say we're six months on, this is the journey, this is where we've got to. Um, and and the, the, the second question was around how Sockhand's working with partner licensed professional bodies to commit um, I don't know whether Phil, you've got any of that, but I think yeah, that's that higher level, strategic level around collaboration um, w- would would be uh, would be a great thing to see. I don't know whether you want to say anything on that, Phil. It's certainly something that we encourage and we we continue to encourage. Um, we don't have any I don't have any specific examples of um, how our professional bodies have committed to using less plastic waste specifically. Uh, we are working with the licensed professional bodies to um to support the, the wider environmental agenda uh, not necessarily specifically plastics um but plastics will fall within there somewhere uh, but not not specifically uh, and clearly we're always working with our uh, licensed bodies to uh, ensure that uh, well to work towards the notion that in order to make environmental decisions, then they must have the competencies to do so, and that's that's one of the main things that we're we're working with licensed bodies to do at the moment, but not specifically plastics. I think it'd be great uh, with some of the case studies, Bill, after uh, after what we've gone through the last six months, is to see if the professional bodies are able to share uh, anything from their specific members. Um, yes. uh, you know, some. I see the questions from from a colleague from uh, from Ricks, and uh, uh, I think yeah, every everybody has a part to play. Whether it's you know uh, agricultural engineering, the Institute of Agricultural Engineers, and the dependence on uh, plastics for baling um, that, that's become predominant over the last thirty years since when I, while I was working in in, in agriculture, um, yeah, and, and the uh, the wind wind blown uh, effect of of those, uh, you know, what's the alternative? Um, uh, it'd be great to see you know, other members from a built environment perspective in, in design and uh, uh, and cost accountancy um, and uh, how they've uh, tested and challenged for uh, designed out uh, plastics or reduced plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in terms of, if I might add to the... Uh work with the society for the environment and our licensed bodies it, a lot of it will come very much down to the the, the environmental professionals within those licensed bodies um, because they are the experts uh, and we will very much like to work with them in order to uh, to move things forward within that licensed body um, mm-hmm. so if people have ideas or um, environmental groups within those licensed bodies and our professional bodies then we very much welcome that conversation and see how we can help um, but like i say we aren't the uh, the environmental professionals but we want to work with and encourage uh, collaboration um, with environmental professionals to make those differences if that makes sense so we have a clarification from the question earlier um end of waste is eu end of waste regulations um minimum quality standards for a material including plastic is considered no longer a waste but a secondary material any any initial thoughts on that one we can always get back to them after the webinar with uh, a bit more of a detailed answer if, if we need some more clarification yeah, and I think it goes back to the end of waste query from from earlier, um, uh, and uh, you know how, how you get to a place of end of life for, for plastics. It's, it's a real challenge. I mean, if you look at end of uh, end of waste for a car, for example, um, that has a significant volume of plastic in it. Um, mm. uh, uh, at what point, you know, I, th- I think the, uh, the challenge of, of defining end of waste is is a good point that uh, 
that's being made. Um, what's the quality standards is the point being made before a material uh, is no longer a waste. Uh, is it just the car or is it the individual components, the secondary components within it? And uh, I think at the moment it's, it's, it's sort of sat at the easier level, which is the, the car is the end of life asset, um, as is the building um, that, that's been dropped and the waste segregation of the, uh, of the materials in there um, is still a waste. Um, uh, but at what point does, uh, um, d does, does that get to, to end of life? Um, and, that's, and that's where we need you know, better detail, clarity around uh, what the uh, waste stream routes are for different types of, uh, of secondary materials. Um, and, and in this case, we're, we're talking about plastics today, but for, all, for each of the, uh, the different types of plastics, you know, whether it's HDP or LDPE uh, in predominant uh, e easy groupings, it's the LDP, which is the more challenging. Um, HDPE has got a higher, a higher value. Uh, and is better sought after, mainly because you can chip it up and then resell it as a cleaned product back to the market. LDPE, you can't. Um, it's lighter weight. It's greater risk of cross-contamination. And at best, if you can get it reasonably clean, uh, is to, to get it into an EF, EFW plant. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we're going to bring questions to a close there, so sorry if we haven't got to your question. If you wanted to have that question answered still, please feel free to email me. My email address was earlier in the webinar. Um, so thank you very much to Caroline and Martin for your time today and in your preparation beforehand as well. Uh, it's, it's very much appreciated and I hope uh, people have learned a reasonable amount from that. Um, just a few more things before we close the webinar today. We have a webinar upcoming, which is on the 5th of December. Again, mentioned earlier in the webinar, that's available for you to register for now. Uh, again, it's a free webinar. It includes speakers such as Adam Reed, who is a Chartered Environmentalist and works for SUEM, and Martin Gettings, again, Chartered Environmentalist and who works with the Canary Wharf group. So please tune in for that one. We also have a number of series coming up with different topics. Um, so the next one is innovations, the good, the bad, and the game changing. And the one after that will be a sustainable built environment. So if we, we are looking for speakers for that, uh, so if you are interested in speaking and providing your insight on a webinar uh, then please do get in touch with my email address there uh, we would very much uh, appreciate that uh, we have a number of slots available in the innovations and the sustainable built environment series also we've already done one webinar uh, in the waste reduction series and that's available now to view as a recording at the web address there as well as recordings of our how to and why become a chartered environmentalist or registered environmental technician. So those webinars are up there as well, which might be quite useful if you are toying with the, with the idea. And that's about it from us. So thank you very much again for the talks today from Caroline and Martin. And uh, hopefully we shall see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>